Hey, it is any old gamer here today to talk about mermaids. No guys, not the mythical ones, the ones in Summoner's War. Ah oh, man, I feel like every time I do one of these videos now, I'm gonna wanna make some sort of awkward sexual innuendo because I started with the twins fetish and when I get to the werewolves, that's just gonna make us both uncomfortable. So maybe I'll try and skip past that. Actually, when I get to the Grim Reapers uh, coming up on our new TA, that's really gonna make us uncomfortable, but no. Uh, so for today, we're gonna be talking about the five mermaids. I'm gonna be doing a bunch of these videos focused on the Nat 4 classes where it's just really a high level overview we're going to talk quickly about each of their skills, recommended rune sets, recommended usage, not going necessarily in-depth. I may do some more in-depth monster spotlights on some of the most meta monsters later, but for right now, just to get out more content, we're probably going to go uh, class by class. So starting off with Cichlid, you can see above my head, I've listed uh, the five mermaids along with the tier that I put them in. This is overall throughout the entire game tier everything taken into consideration along with some recommended builds. So I do recommend that Cichlid be built in Swift and we'll talk about why in a moment, but let's just start off with her skills. Uh, her skill three, Crushed Hopes. This was buffed uh, at the start of RTA season before last. Uh, it it's a really interesting skill. I think it's um, the only skill in the game that does everything like this, which is basically a strip, a defense break, and then a full skill reset. Uh, only an 80% activation rate, but as long as she's fully skilled, it does jump up to 100%. So the first thing to know about her is I really wouldn't want to use her if she was full, un unless she was fully skilled. Uh, that 80% activation rate is a problem when the entire role that she serves on your team may not even happen. Now, uh, mathematically, we know that she's going to succeed with either defense break or skill reset about 70% of the time because she's going through multiple accuracy checks. But for some reason, I didn't trust the game, so I did like 100 tests in Arena, testing different resistance leads and stuff, uh, and it came out exactly where it should have been. It was time well spent, <laughs> but... Uh, so yes, you can expect to succeed with her. I think it's about 72% of the time. Um, somebody in comments, I'm sure, is going to correct me and do the advanced math, but... Um, as far as the fact that she's going through three separate accuracy checks, but if the first accuracy check fails, which is the stripping of immunity, the other two are guaranteed to fail, it works out to about 70%, somewhere around there. So that makes her a little bit unreliable, and this is why I've got her in A tier, because her second and first skills, while useful, really don't do enough to use her in uh, most comps if her third skill has failed. So the second skill is just a full cleanse with a shield. It's a really thick shield, but it's just single target, one shield every three turns. The skill one is the same skill as what most of the mermaids have, which is a single target strip, but it's only 50% activation rate. Now you will notice that the damage skills uh, to max HP, and I will say the mermaids have a good multiplier on their skill one because of the max HP, they can actually hit really hard. So the normal build for all of them is gonna be speed HP HP, or in a couple of cases, speed HP accuracy with really high HP subs. So you're not gonna have the crit rate necessary to really take advantage of that multiplier usually. Uh, now, for Cichlid, mostly where you're going to use her is if you're trying to work some sort of control or nuke or snipe comp in uh, four-star siege bases. That's really her primary role, but she does have that uh, really high 110 base speed. It makes it um, easy to, to ruin her super fast, um, almost as high as the Vigor base speed. But since Vigor is usually either in will runes or in violent runes, you can fairly reliably outspeed him. She must have 85 accuracy for the skill three. That's the one that really matters. So if you've got an artifact that gives you a bunch of accuracy, like I think I've got, um, I've got an extra five accuracy on my artifact, which I don't need because I'm, I'm already over the 85 uh, effective cap, right? But if you've got an artifact with accuracy, you can go a little bit lower. So then you could go like speed, HP, HP. Uh, as far as her artifacts go, the only thing she really needs are crit damage reduction, damage from fire and wind reduction and skill three accuracy. Skill one accuracy is all right as well, but uh, she doesn't heal, she doesn't have sustain, she doesn't do damage, so she doesn't really need a whole lot from the artifacts, and you can put it all into like a skill three accuracy thing, lower the rune requirements, and then put her in that speed HP HP. Uh, you can also do triple HP if you just have crazy fast speed subs, uh, but you are gonna wanna usually stick with Swift because she is a turn one monster. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about with Cichlid is uh, Special League and RTA. So she really has no place in arena offense or defense. She really has no place in like Siege or Guild content defense, no place in PVE. 
Uh, for special leaks, she can be really useful. Again, crazy high base speed gives you the opportunity to get an immediate reset. So for four star special league or possibly even 20 star special leagues, uh, she could be really useful if you built a comp around her. Now, in RTA, when she was first buffed, people said, oh wow, there's gonna be a Hathor counter. Uh, she really never materialized as such. Now, the last thing I want to close off with, I've been kind of hard on Cichlid, but I will say her skill three is amazing. Skill one strip is really useful. I feel like she's just one more small buff away from jumping into at least S tier, uh, possibly even SS tier. And that buff is pretty straightforward. She needs some sort of sustain on her skill two. The biggest problem you have with her is that bringing her in takes up one of your three spots does not offer sustain and does not offer damage. So you're right now kind of forced to bring her into a YOLO situation. All she needs is that sustain and she would become a really premium monster. Okay, next up, we've got Platy. Now I've got Platy in the A tier as well, but I will say she's borderline S tier when you consider the fact that she's a four star and can be used in four star siege bases. In older metas, she probably was S tier. She doesn't work quite as well in the current Bruiser meta for one big reason, and that's Vigor. So Platy's got a 95 base speed, Vigor's got 115 base speed, and Vigor is attribute advantage over Platy. So that's a problem. Uh, because you're really just, you're going to get dominated by that Vigor. Now, with that said, uh, the way I've got her runed is not the way I'm going to recommend ruining her. So, like with the Cichlid, I actually think that was a really solid uh, guideline. I didn't spend a lot of time on it. If you looked at my stats, uh, maybe you can't quite match the speed, but the overall build, that was that was where I would go with Cichlid. With the Platy right here, I think the overall build is going in the right direction with one big caveat, which is that she needs to have at least 50, probably 85 accuracy. So what I really need to do is give her an accuracy slot six in this build. Um, but I, I very rarely use Platy, and she's just kind of in whatever rune she's in right now. Uh, if I were to start using her again, I would not use her like this. She's got to have that accuracy. Now, with that said, let's take a quick look at her kit and see why that accuracy matters so much. And it comes down to her skill three. It attacks the enemy, it does a one turn stun, and then it does a full skill cooldown reset. Uh, in addition to that, if her health is at 50% or lower, she stuns the enemy for two turns. That does uh, skill up to 100% rate again. So as with Cichlid, uh, not, not super reliable if she's not fully skilled up. So I usually wouldn't want to use her. But I will say she fits a little bit into a little bit better into bruiser teams, which does give you that that uh, cushion. Like if she fails with her skill three, because first of all, you're not going to usually bring her in in swift. You're usually going to have her in violent and you're going to be playing more turn two with her. So if she fails with her skill three, it's not as devastating of a blow as when the cichlid fails with her skill three. So if she's not fully skilled up, you can get away with a little bit more. Now, her skill two is going to do that sustain that I was talking about. And this is why she allow this is why she fits a little bit better in those bruiser comps. So she recovers the allies target HP by 30%, also gives a 30% attack bar boost. And then she can revive as well. So it's an either or. Uh, it's the same skill we're going to talk about with Beta later, where you have a choice that she can either revive an ally or she can heal and attack bar boost an ally. If she does revive the ally, it adds three turns of cooldown time, which is pretty significant. Uh, and it's one of the reasons that I don't have her in S tier right now. Uh, the skill one is going to be uh, the same as all of the other mermaids, but she is the mermaid that's got that 100% activation rate, which is significant. Uh, the fact that she's going to reliably activate to strip on skill one also does damage scaling to max HP. If you are a late game player, something like speed crit rate HP or even possibly speed crit rate accuracy with just tons and tons of HP, speed and defense in the subs, would make for a really interesting build with her. Now, as far as where you can use her, everything I said about Cichlid for Special League applies for Platy as well. Uh, different usage, obviously, but she is a really unique and interesting monster for four-star Special League, 20-star Special League. Um, I've seen players like Ta uh, Takish, who's a G2 player, I've seen him use her in RTA. I think Platy is slightly more viable for RTA than Cichlid. Although, going back to what I said at the start, because we're in the Vigor meta, I don't think Platy is as viable today as she was six months ago. Now, um, as with Cichlid, I think she's just a couple of small tweaks away from being an S tier. I would actually like to see them buff her because I think her kit is super fun and I think it could help to evolve the meta a little bit from where it is right now because we're oversaturated with Vigors. We want to see some changes, guys. 
Uh, so especially if Cichlid and Platy monsters like this, if they were evolved just a little bit more to bring them back into the meta, it might allow us to drift a little away, a little bit away from that Vigor meta. So the first thing she needs is a higher base speed. 95 base speed is really, really hard to deal with for a support type unit. Um, she maybe doesn't need to get up to the crazy 110 of the Cichlid, but even like 104, 103, 106, somewhere around there, something like that would help a lot. Uh, the second thing is this added cooldown should probably just be one turn of cooldown time added. Make there be a little bit of penalty for reviving, that's fine, but three turns is too much. It takes the skill out of play for way too long. So make the overall cooldown like four turns when you revive or three turns when you heal. And then I think those little changes right there, her skill three is already amazing. So I think those little tweaks right there would bring her into the meta. They put her somewhere around S tier uh, because she's really right on the cusp of S tier right now. She's lower more because of the current meta than because of her current kit. So you give her those little buffs, bring her back into the meta, and she's a lot of fun to play around with. Okay, next up we've got Beta. Now you'll see I've got Beta listed as A tier. I will say that this was probably the hardest of them to determine. Beta is somewhere on the border between A and S tier. Beta is another one of those monsters that was extremely OP in some of the older metas and she actually fits really well into the Bruiser meta. But as we've had two A's, as we've had balance patches, as the game has progressed, she's fallen just a little bit further behind and it mostly all has to do with this cooldown. Her overall kit is amazing. So her skill three is gonna do an AOE heal, it gives a crit damage reduction, and it gives immunity. But if you compare that to the Vigor S2, which is a three turn cooldown, Vigor S2 does not give you immunity, but it gives you a bigger heal. And obviously Vigor is gonna be much more of a premium damage dealer along with that defense break. So while Beta is able to do something kind of similar to Vigor, I mean, it's a little different because she gives immunity. Um, she's basically just outshined by Vigor and it's largely because of that cooldown. Now, the Beta S2, very different than anything Vigor does. It's actually the same S2 as Platy, kind of similar to Elusia as well. Uh, so once again, another 2A that's kind of matched her skill. Uh, however, Beta can resurrect. Uh, same thing as Platy, it adds three current turns to the cooldown if she does resurrect. So once again, it's a cooldown issue. Now her skill one is the same thing as most of the mermaids, which is, um, you know, 50% chance to strip, damage scaling to HP. Once again, she does really good damage. Um, being an LD4, she has a really, really good base HP, over 11,000. So in a damage build, she can actually hit uh, very significantly hard with that skill one. But again, you know, most of the time you're gonna be using non-damage dealing skills in the skill two and the skill three. So you're not gonna build her for damage because all those stats would only be used once every three or four turns. At the end of the day, Beta is still amazing on defense, uh, nowhere near as good as even her sister Molly, uh, but still a very good monster, especially if you're in uh, like mid, mid Guardian 1 or down, she's still a really powerful monster in 4 star siege based defense, uh, but she's a monster you're very rarely going to use on offense. Now, one of her biggest advantages is that 110 base speed, so again, you have the ability to build her super fast in a swift build and push out immunity. That's why we saw her in SWC, but we also saw her not do so well in SWC, uh, because if you put her in a swift build, and again, I just keep harping on this cooldown, but if you put her in a swift build, a five turn cooldown is eternity. She kind of has to be in violent, um, or you're just not gonna be able to do anything with her except for skill one most of the fight. Now, you'll see the build that I've got on her right now, Violent Will. This is uh, the strongly recommended build for Veta. I've got her in a very slow build. Uh, I know that looks kind of strange. The reason is because she is just on a siege defense for me, so she's speed tuned. Uh, the 60 resistance because she's in a Tessarian team, so that gives her you know maximum resistance. Uh, so she's actually in a reasonably high efficiency build. It's just slower because it's speed tuned. What I have is the whole team in will, and then I want her to act last, putting up immunity. Uh, and once again, it comes down to this cooldown uh, because it's only a two turn immunity on a five turn cooldown. I have her acting last, so we get a little bit longer duration of immunity. Now, as far as um, bringing her back to S tier, the same things I really talked about with Platy, it's just little tweaks. If you drop the additional cooldown off the revive right here, uh, which I think is very reasonable because you've got a Ladriel on an AOE resurrect. I mean, there's, there's a lot more resurrecting monsters out there. 
So if you drop the additional cooldown from the skill two and you drop the skill three to a four turn cooldown, I think Beto would be extremely useful again, just because she does have such amazing stats for uh, being a four star monster, LD4 granted, but for being a four star monster, uh, those little tweaks to cooldown would bring her back into the meta. But barring some little buffs to her, I view her mainly as, I, I would say, like almost a gimmick monster. So obviously she can be really good in special league. She's really good in four-star siege defenses. Uh, she works well with uh, some Tessarian defenses if you don't have Molly, which I don't. Um, and outside of that, you're not going to use her on offense all that often. There are other immunity buffers that work on a lower cooldown that do more. So if you're bringing her in just for immunity, uh, just bringing in Fran would usually be more effective. You don't get that crit resist, but you get the attack buff, which is usually going to matter more. Uh, Fran's base stats obviously not as good, but... Uh, something like Fran and Vigor brought in together would wind up giving you more overall than Beto with almost anything else. And now you're talking two free-to-play monsters as opposed to an LD4. So most of her value, the reason I've got her in A tier is uh, for defense purposes and for four-star special league. All right, next up, we've got Tetra. Now, if you guys have ever watched any of my streams, you know Tetra is one of my absolute favorite four-stars. I've got her in SS tier. Um, you could honestly argue that she belongs in triple S tier. At least I could argue that. Maybe most people wouldn't. Uh, but I think Tetra... Tetra got... By the way, Tetra was buffed in the last balance patch. And I didn't even think she needed a buff at that time. Um, I think Tetra's kit is amazing. Especially if you're in um, like Guardian 1. Mid Guardian 1 guilds or below. She's an amazing two-man uh, monster. Because she's going to give you... Uh, well, let, let's just take a look at her kit. So on her passive, she's going to reduce the um, the duration of all um, harmful effects except for inability effects. She's also going to heal the ally with the lowest HP status by 10% of her HP, not their HP, every single turn. So obviously you're going to build her in speed HP, HP, or triple HP if you can. Uh, she doesn't need a whole lot of stats, so if you can throw some resistance onto her, that's great. I normally do, uh, but for the build she's in right now, I was trying to speed tune her. I didn't have the runes available, so I sacrificed the resistance. But the, the recommended build for her is definitely speed, HP, HP, violent nemesis, max resistance. And if you actually have really good uh, HP slot two runes with big speed, uh, triple HP, even better, but you do want her to act first on your team, and we're going to talk about why in just a moment. Now, her skill two, uh, it's going to be the same thing as the Cichlid skill two. Uh, it's extremely, it's a its a really useful skill two, honestly, uh, especially if you've got her on violent, that three turn cooldown goes by really quickly, and when you think about the fact that she's already uh, reducing the duration of all um, harmful effects other than inability, she's basically got the you know, skilled to take one monster out of inability while reducing harmful effects on everybody else. Uh, and then that shield, it's, it's really beefy. It's 25% of her max HP. You guys can see how much I really like Tetra. I feel like I'm just like upselling her, but she's amazing, guys. She really, really is amazing. I mean, it's an elemental four star that hard counters Gianna and Neftis. Think about that. Two of the five or six best LD5s in the game are both hard countered by an elemental four star and one you didn't even, you don't even have to skill her up to hard counter them, uh, especially Gianna. Tetra could practically solo Gianna. Uh, actually, I think Tetra probably could solo Gianna. If it was just 1v1, I think Tetra would actually win them. The one that I use Tetra the most against though, because you obviously don't see a lot of Gianna Neftis um, unless there's other threats on the team. You're not going in 1v1. Uh, but Tetra completely crushes vir virtually every defense with Jean on it. So if it's Jean blank blank, usually there's a stripper with the Jean. So you have at least two non-damage dealers. I like to two-man those teams. I bring in Tetra and Teor or Tetra and any big um, damage dealer as long as Tetra is the one that's drawing the attacks because she's tanky. Um, and then basically she's going to completely cool down those provokes. So Jean does the provoke, Tetra cools it down, you break out of that cycle of control right away, and then you just kill the damage threat on the other side, and then you can just very slowly uh, win out the fight. Uh, Tetra skill one, once again, same thing as most of the mermaids, 50% chance to strip, scales to max HP. You're mostly going to use her as a hard counter to any kind of provoke team. Now, she has no place on defense whatsoever. She's an offensive monster, but she's great in arena. 
Uh, so if you guys are struggling with uh, Titan control team, uh, excuse me, Triton control teams, by the way, like if it's Triton, John, Rika, you bring in a Tetra and she just like counters that entire team by herself. Uh, great for Guild War offense, same concepts, and then great for Siege offense, obviously, as well. Okay, last up is Molly. I've got her in triple S tier. Um, I mean, I don't know that I really need to speak, spend that much time talking about Molly. I think right now, everybody knows about Molly. She got buffed in the last balance patch. She is one of the two most meta monsters in the game. If you caught the Molly Hall of Heroes, and obviously there was not an HOH, but if you caught the Molly Hall of Heroes, you won the jackpot on the last ba balance patch. As you can see from the screen, I did not catch that HOH. Um, but so taking a look at Molly just really quickly, just in case you are like on your first day of playing Summoner's War and even then you probably still know who Molly is. But uh, if you don't know who she is uh, or what she does, skill two, same thing as uh, Tetra. Uh, basically, she's going to cleanse Tetra and Cichlid. She's going to cleanse and then give a really, really thick shield. Uh, but she is all about her passive. So the passive has two parts and each of them is extremely powerful. One of those is that she recovers the HP of the ally with the worst HP status by 25%. One of the tricks to dealing with a Molly, by the way, is splitting your damage because she only heals the enemy with the lowest HP. So you actually kind of kind of like the same way that you work on a Kamoon, right? Like um, you you would lower the HP of one monster so Kamoon shields that one and then you snipe the other monster so there's no shield on it. You do kind of the same thing with Molly, where you lower the HP of one monster so that Molly heals that monster and then work to snipe the other monster by lowering its HP, but just a little bit less. Now, anyway, with that said, um, one of the things that makes Molly feel so broken is obviously putting her on violent runes. Uh, you definitely do want her on violent runes. Um, speed HP HP or triple HP, violent nemesis, max resistance if you can, uh, but just as much HP, as tanky as you can, as fast as you can in violent runes. That's really the only acceptable build for Molly because one proc is so devastating every time it's 25% heal. One proc is really devastating. Um, and then just make her super tanky. Now, the other part of her passive, and this is the part where everybody's screaming nerf Molly, I actually don't have that big of a problem with her heal. The problem with Molly, and I, I'm not one of those people who thinks she needs to be nerfed. I think she's really strong. I would be okay if she got nerfed, but I'm not calling for it. But if she were to get nerfed, what needs to change is the other part of her passive, which is uh, she increases the chances of allies receiving a glancing hit by 25%. Uh, excuse me, by 20%. By 20%, the heal's 25. So the, the problem for me with this is that it's just adding a ton of RNG, but it also changes the monsters you can bring in against her. Uh, so the reason you see Molly on practically every defense now is because you can't reliably Lucian those defenses. So it opens up a whole, you don't have to, you don't have to think about death prevention. You don't have to think about making them super fast. You don't have to think about all the things you would normally do to avoid being Lucian. Just having Molly's passive there where it gives a chance of glancing is enough to intimidate a lot of people out of trying to bring in Lucian. Uh, that to me is a little bit of a balance issue because it's what puts Molly into every single defense because she's got a really low base speed. 95 is a very low base speed. Um, other stats are good. You know, she's got good base stats. She's an LD4, but with that speed and with the builds you're putting her in, you know, a, a really well ruined Molly is 250, 260. Most of the time they're going to be uh, in some sort of comp with a Vigor, but not necessarily with a speed lead. So you could dovolution those teams if it wasn't for the glancing. That's where we run into the issue. Now, with that said, um, I don't personally expect to see Molly nerfed. I don't think she's quite out of the re quite into the realm of broken, but she is absolutely triple S tier. Uh, if you've got her, you can use her pretty much everywhere. Arena defense, siege defense, guild war defense, RTA defense. Well, there is no RTA defense. <laughs> <laughs> RTA period, uh, special league, basically all forms of special league. I would think that she could even work honestly in some early game B12 teams, uh, would probably be great in Giants B12. Um, obviously they'd be much slower teams. Uh, not, not something that you would use once you got into mid game, but if you happen to have her early game, she would probably work in those PVE metas as well. Could be really interesting in some of the dimensional hole content. Like she is a super, 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 uh, support unit. She's like a, a superstar, an NBA superstar for support units. 
Um, but yeah, so there you go, guys. Um, I've got the lowest of the mermaids in A tier, which is Cichlid. Most families are probably not going to be able to say that. Overall, I think mermaids are one of the strongest families. And interestingly, they very rarely get recognition. Tetra, to me, is the most underrated monster in the game. I think she is, she's, she's like a Veramos on steroids. And Veramos, I mean, I, yes, it's, it's fusionable, free to play, but it's still an LD5. Tetra is a water nat four, and I do think Tetra is like a much better version of Veramos. Um, Vero can do a little bit more damage. Tetra provides a lot better of a support role, but that's a whole different debate. There are a lot of Veramos loyalists out there as well. Um, I personally prefer Tetra. Either way, I think you're probably going to do great with either of them, but if we're comparing a Water Nat 4 to an LD5, you know it's good. So on that note, guys, um, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you found it useful. Hope you go out and build some mermaids, and we'll see you next time. Hey guys, if you're still with me to this point, then that means that you probably liked the video, found it entertaining, or even better, both. So please smash the like button, hit the subscribe button, and leave a comment down below because those things help the channel grow, and more importantly, they show me that the video is useful, and that's the whole reason I do this in the first place.